This is the Biblical Mind Podcast, produced by the Center for Hebraic Thought. Honest five-star reviews help others find this podcast. Visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org for articles and videos that explore the deep structures of Scripture. What are some main perplexities, challenges, questions you get, uh, or things that you have to explain uh, when teaching about the conceptual world of the Old Testament authors? Well, you know, the challenges are several as I see them and as I've taught over the past few decades. There's there's a lot of problems posed by just the fact that we live at such great remove chronologically, culturally, et cetera, from the biblical authors, Old Testament or New Testament. That's That's a major problem that generates difficulties in, I think, sensitively, empathetically reading the scripture, and also in the way that it it, it generates problems for us as readers with our own sort of modern proclivities, our own sort of things that trigger us, that concern us, that are quite different than than it was in the ancient world. So how do you help somebody who has a burning question that was stirred up by the biblical text, but you're looking at the biblical text that you're reading with that person saying, yeah, I don't think they care about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they're asking that question. Not that your question's bad, but I don't think they're asking that question. Yeah, it's very difficult, I think. And I think it's harder every year I've been teaching. It's increasingly harder, I think. And that might be because just every year that goes by, it's more water under the bridge, further further from the turn of the eras, further from the Iron Age mm. and everything else. I, I think... Uh, Part of it has to do with trying to cultivate readers who, as I implied a moment ago, that are empathetic readers, first and foremost, before they're evaluative, that their evaluation may or may not be accurate if they don't have any sort of empathy or, or kind of emic understanding of the text at hand. Now, the chronological difference, cultural difference, et cetera, complicates empathy and complicates kind of emic or inductive understandings of these things. But it seems to me any interpretation of anything in any field, Bible or medicine or law or whatever, depends first and foremost on an accurate understanding of the thing that's being interpreted before you can evaluate or make a prognosis or make a determination about this or that or the other thing. So, but, but that's, that's sort of empathy is kind of a hard one disposition, you know, that, that you don't just automatically wake up with. I think I think some people have it more than others, and they probably have it more than others, you know, dispositionally or because of how they're raised or whatever. But all all people can, I think, work towards empathetic, interpretive stances towards towards scripture or, or again any other object. And that to me seems the sine qua non. You know, you got to have that before you evaluate. So if a student leads hard and heavy with evaluation, I'm going to. Be like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've been sufficiently empathetic. Your evaluation seems to me cynical, you know, without mm. without being appropriately sensitive. Have you walked in the shoes of this text at all or these people or whatever? Same thing if it's just all empathy and no evaluation. It's just, you know, solipsistic, it's simplistic, etc. Nice. That's a nice rubric for thinking about the text is empathetic and evaluation. Well, they I, do require, I should, I yeah, should say ahead. I got it from a church historian, one of my favorite teachers at Princeton Seminary, Paul Roram, wrote a wonderful essay on empathy and evaluation in early church history and in pastoral practice. And since I read that essay, it's hmm. sort of been with me and I've used it as, as a pedagogical rubric ever since. So shout out to Paul Roram. <laughs> I mean, e- e- even in the field of counseling, I... I, I've recently been reading a book on, and, and they, they talk about people, I think they might've been talking about me, who, when they listen to somebody else, they immediately jump to evaluation. And, and yeah. this book is trying to get you to slow down and be empathetic first before. So this seems like a general skill in life to be a good friend, spouse, child, et cetera. I think so. I mean, it, it related is something I picked up from an essay by Simone Bay that is, is attention, you know, that these school studies of any sort, Latin, math, theology, whatever, these can cultivate in us good habits towards the love of God if, if, mm. if they're pursued that way. And one of, one of the 
two things that she says can can eventuate from school studies rightly understood is is humility and attention humility is you know kind of if you get a bad grade you might have actually deserved it <laughs> so you mm. might you might actually think about what i did wrong and what i could do better but she, the, the the majority of the essay is devoted to attention you know being able to attend to something other than ourselves i think that's actually yeah. a seriously dying art form in our culture so. Certainly, and especially that if you get a bad grade, you deserve it mentality. <laughs> That's a, a, that, that died a long time ago. Man. That is a very much so a dying art. Yeah, um, yeah, I do want to, because this is this is a constant problem of the empathetic reading. I, the analogy I've been using is I'm going to you know in my class I'm going to turn up the volume on the biblical author's voice louder than tradition and louder than theology and uh, although that's not entirely possible because we're always bringing tradition and theology to, sure, to the text true. with us but and I found that many students this this actually puts them off you know when they want to know like well is God omniscient or not in this text yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. like I don't think that that's what the biblical authors uh, want you to be thinking about at this point yeah I like and, that Ber Bergamon has a little essay where he's he, he's talking about his teaching practice and and says at one point in kind of the exegetical model that he would teach in his classes, he really encouraged students to ask themselves, what does this text say about God, the world, whatever, if it were the only text we had? Mm. You know, if, we had if this were the only text we had, what would we say about those things? Don't think about the other texts. That's a later move. That's, a, that's, a, that's down the pike. For this particular exercise, this particular instrument, what, it, what is this? text say and to me that's again kind of rigorous attention hopefully empathetic towards that one kind of singular witness and thinking about the other witnesses that's important we do it like you said we can't help but do it there's all kinds of stuff rattling around our brain but it's a real exercise and discipline to sort of mm. sit with the one text and wonder about it and and ask ourselves if we're giving it sufficient attention yeah, I've been reading Leon Cass's new book on Exodus, and he emphasizes this. It is kind of an artificial way to read. I'm going to say, I'm going to read Exodus 1 like I don't know about Exodus 5, and I don't right, know about right, right. Exodus 15, 14 and 15. And I've called that a disciplined reading. I, I, I think there's, it's a practice that I don't think most Christians have ever learned. From my experience, it's not something you learn in in the various st styles of reading Bible in, in churches or in preaching. With that said, you wrote uh, a famous book in my world, or to me, it's famous. <laughs> thank uh, you, thank you so much. You, my mom, you, my mom. Yeah, <laughs> I might be your biggest fan on this book. It's called "The Old Testament Is Dying," which has a great title as well. And so, can you give us a, a thumbnail sketch? What do you mean by that? That the old, this is like is. Is this kind of like God is dead? Do you actually mean the Old <laughs> Testament is dying, or uh, yeah. what are you what are you talking about? Why is it important? Well, I'm, I'm glad you like the title because the press tried to talk me out of it, and I really thought it worked. What? So, yes, they did, and so I'm glad I'm glad they let me let me have my title. Oh, titles ever. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I like the title a lot, and uh, that we should say that the subtitle is a diagnosis and recommended treatment. Right? The yes. subtitle is yeah. important because it's it's not like I'm wanting it to die. Of course, I don't, and I'm trying to do what I can to prevent its death. But but yeah, the book just outlines what I had sort of felt implicitly for quite some time, and then slowly dawned on me over the course of years teaching at the theological seminaries and teaching in churches that the Old Testament in so many uh, in my judgment, so many pockets of North American Christianity, but also beyond, in, in light of some some of the data that I assessed, is, is really in a beleaguered state. And in the book, I compare the phenomenon to the life cycle of human language. So languages can can sort of be birthed, they, can, they get learned, they can be spoken fluently and well and passed on, or they can not be learned and not be spoken fluently and die out rather quickly. And it just sort of dawned on me one day as I was making my commute. Uh, at that time, I taught in Atlanta. So there was a lot of time on the commute <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> listening to, to a class. It was on, uh, probably on uh, CD at that time, but uh, hmm. streaming some class on, on human linguistics by, by John McWhorter, my favorite, my favorite linguist. And it just sort of dawned on me that what McWhorter was talking about in terms of the life cycle of human languages applied to my discipline of Old Testament studies in my classroom, as I was trying to teach students, I suddenly realized I'm, I'm trying to teach them a language and no wonder some of them are struggling 
because learning a language is hard, especially mm -hmm. if you're past puberty. And some of them are further along than others. This makes sense too, right? Because some language learners know more than others. And But it's a second language acquisition. It's difficult and explains why some people aren't good at it and it, it's too late for them. And so suddenly I had this aha moment and the stuff, and I started digging into this, the linguistic side further to see what could I derive from that that might be helpful in analyzing the decline of the Old Testament in so many Christian circles and, and perhaps reversing it. But in, in, the, in, in brief, the, the prognosis is something, you know, quite, quite uh, simple. I think in the book, I say, you know, in many pockets of North American Christianity, at least, the Old Testament has ceased to function in healthy ways in people's lives as authoritative canonical scripture. And uh, that decline, I think, can be measured. And I try to do that in the book a good bit. And then you can try to assess its ramifications, the negative ramifications of this decline. And and then also talk about some possible ways that it might be resisted. Yeah, I think I think it, it was important to me because it touched so much of what I see. I have mostly people, you have more graduate students. I'm, I'm more on the front end. They're coming in as undergraduates. And they, they're interested in what scripture has to say about things. But I realized as I would talk through them, you know, they'd ask about issues of sexuality or economics or how do we treat the poor. And as you begin walking through the vocabulary of scripture on these topics mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. maintain it, that many of them just didn't know any of these stories or they didn't know how these terms worked or they didn't right. realize that even the poor, that term needs to be translated into what that would look like in modern America because there's no identical version of biblical property right, in right. America. And and at some point I realized, you know, everybody can hold in their head like three or four things they've never heard of before. Like they nod along. But once you hit that <laughs> fifth, sixth, seventh thing they've never heard of before mm -hmm. or they've never thought of that way, they yeah. kind of just go, okay, I, I can't do this or yeah, this isn't the Christianity good. I signed up for. So yeah, I do wonder what is what what is one of the better ways that you've heard of or found maybe since the book i'm sure you've heard lots of people talking about how do we get people literate in scripture again especially the old testament what are some of the ways you've heard of that are somewhat successful in redeveloping this linguistic skill of understanding scripture yeah i mean i i'm still fishing around for what i think is is our you know maybe the best practice i have some sense of the best practices but i, I don't i can't say that i've always seen them in mm. the flesh you know with my own eyes in, in action i think there's pockets of excellence of course and sometimes people resist the book or resist my points in the book by what you know by by pointing out that here oh well here's a pocket of excellence and right you know exceptions prove the rule all the time right, right. you know of course i'm not worried about pockets of excellence i'm i'm worried about the the vast seas of mediocrity <laughs> right, right. And, and so i do think there's pockets of excellence there's there's people that <clears throat> buck the trend individually and corporately as well i think though some people who resist the the argument are mostly guilty of cases of, of wishful thinking they or a kind of simple fideism you know well the scripture would never die you know right but if you read the book i think it it's got enough in there that shows that it, it can, and parts of it have for Protestants, like the Apocrypha in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the Reformation period. And there's some empirical data, not just anecdotal or argumentative data, that kind of that I think demonstrates the decline. But that being said, you know, to your question proper, I I think you know the the ultimate prognosis in the book is really simple as well. If the diagnosis is somewhat simple, the the fix is somewhat simple. That you know, what has to happen for the Old Testament to survive in in Christian circles is what we need is, you know, regular and extensive use of the Old Testament at and in formative moments of Christian faith and practice. You know, more Old Testament and Christian worship, more Old Testament and Christian hymnody, songs, mm -hmm. including contemporary Christian music, more Old Testament sermons. Moral and 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 maybe even Old Testament only, you know, Old Testament only songs, right. only sermons, you know, Old Testament only lectionary, you know, reading, etc. So, in some ways, what you have to have, and this is this is just straight from language class 101, you have to have a community of speakers who mm -hmm. are trying to speak the language, and then are communicating it to the next generation, which don't have to be their own biological kids, though, though that would help. It could be anybody sort of new to the new to the language community. 
But what you need is is input and output. You know, you got you got to have a teacher sort of teaching you French, and you have to go to the French language lab and practice. You know, mm. and ideally, the best thing is kind of language immersion. So a pocket of excellence that sometimes people raise with me, and I've seen it. You know, is things like the disciple Bible study curriculum that was really uh, big in some Methodist churches among mm-hmm. others uh, about ten years ago, fifteen years ago. It was really rather intense, small group experience. I think it was like 32 weeks or something, or maybe more. And they're reading a lot of Bible, you know, several hours a week of Bible. They're committing to several hours a week of Bible reading, then getting together to talk for a couple hours at, once a week. And, you know, that, that kind of a language immersion did expose people extensively to a lot of the Old Testament for the first time in their lives. And these are oftentimes really well-meaning Christians who've been around the church their whole life never really cracked the thing open, you know, and I thought this was great. But what happened in my own local church frequently was that these disciple study groups would call me. It's like, mm-hmm. we have an emergency on our hands. You know, we, we finally read the Old Testament and we hate it. <laughs> There's and, you know, some things in there that we need to talk about. Yeah. So I would bring in the crash cart with me, you know, you know, yeah. Claire, you know, try to get this, this body back up to, to alive again that they, huh. they were struggling with. So language immersion, you know, that that's a cool idea. But I think it ultimately comes down to, to regular Christian practice. That can be done in some kind of corporate settings, and it should be done, worship, education, et cetera. But it also has to be done at an individual level. Fluency is, thankfully, I mean, I mean, it's it's kind of a the downside, but it's also a silver lining. It's a lifetime project, especially yeah. if the, if the, if the language is difficult. So no no worries if we're not fully fluent yet. I don't know of anybody maybe who really is, but right. like, that's just a part of of the life of faith. It seems to me is to try try to get there. And I think in my experience, most people don't try. I, yeah, I would I would second that. There's a at best you got a Bible in a year reading program that <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Commit to as hard as they can mm-hmm. uh, until they can't anymore. Usually, around that's really, if that means well, but that's not a pocket of excellence, yeah, right? Exactly. Now exactly. I've started when I was a kid. I started those, and you know, by the time I got to February first, I was three months behind. You know. Yeah. I do. I'm going to catch up this weekend. I'm going to catch up this yeah, weekend. Yeah, I'm going to read yeah. all of Leviticus. I, I think there are some, if I could say, uh, dispersed pockets of e- excellence. So I was talking to a colleague of mine who knows the African-American church scene very well because he's been a part of it for decades. And we were talking about something simple. So along the lines of what you suggested here is that you're preaching and teaching from the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Or or we, even when you're teaching from the New Testament, you're also teaching from the Old Testament right, in strategic right, right. ways. And he pointed out to me a uh, church, which I will not mention by name, but it's a very famous church in New York City, a uh, mm. very well, well-known well church. And they were going over Nehemiah, or, or sorry, they're talking about repentance, right? So they're dealing with some race issues and trying to help the church think through issues of race and reconciliation. And apparently somebody asked in a post-church follow-up, well, what's is? are there any good examples of repentance, like communal repentance, not individual, but communal repentance in the Bible? And and the pastors begin like going through the New Testament and kind of saying, well, no, we don't actually, we don't even have, we don't really have examples of this that tell you how to repent or give some model demonstration of repentance. And he's telling me about this, and I'm standing there slack jawed, going, All right, well, a th- what they started in the New Testament, and b <laughs> I can think of a few texts in the Hebrew Bible, uh, yeah. like yeah. Nehemiah, and 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 I just looked at him and I said, what. In, in within the black church, would would they have not had anything to say? And he said, no, they would have taken. They would have all known these texts and in yeah, uh, yeah. Nehemiah. They would have they would have taken there and thought about them. And and what it struck a chord in me was that. And here is what he said that what I thought was really profound. He said, "Look, in this church, it's a great church, but they're going to give a sermon on the New Testament. Not this church, but the the, the kind of mm-hmm. type of church. They're going to mm-hmm. give a sermon on the New Testament and." All the illustrations in that sermon are going to be derived from pop culture, you know, mm-hmm. Academy Award winning movies, mm-hmm. New York Times bestseller books, right. po- poets they've read in recently. And he said, you go in the black church, they'll preach the same passage from the New Testament and all the illustrations are going to be from the Old Testament. And so there's a, that kind of 
weird sense of sufficiency in the black church that has n- not caught on in the in the recent. I would say maybe there's some older pockets. I'm sorry, I'm using your pocket a metaphor yeah, not. I, I'm sure there are Depression era circuits of churches in America that, of various uh, ethnicities that held on to the Old Testament a little bit more tightly. I think in the Pentecostal, you're in the Wesleyan tradition. I think in the Pentecostal yeah. tradition, the Old mm-hmm. Testament plays a much more significant role mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. thinking. Yeah. So I think, I think when we good. say the Old Testament is nine, sorry, when we say the Old Testament is nine, I wonder if we're really just talking about specific segments of the church or not. I think so, though, and and I want to believe that too. And and it, and it's it's been said about my book in published reviews, for instance. You know, some things like this, like like you're 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 pointing out, and I and I agree. I mean, again, there's pockets of excellence. Unfortunately, the the the, the most empirical test that I run in the book is based on the U, U.S. Religious Knowledge Survey that mm. we conducted in 2010, and it shows actually no pockets of excellence across hmm. denominational or ethnic lines the 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 only pockets of excellence within the christian communion the, the traditional christian community the pockets of excellence the highest scoring groups demographics are atheists agnostics and jews out outscore every other demographic of course. yeah so that's that includes a catholic protestant white african-american hispanic etc evangelical mainline so that test which is not perfect but that's our only empirical test mm-hmm. actually shows that there's there's not really any pockets of excellence within the Christian communion, <laughs> yeah. which, which is, you know, not something to laugh about, except maybe, you know, uncomfortably. So, so lost my <laughs> laugh as an uncomfortable laugh, you know, but, but I do think that what you're pointing out is, is right, that there are certain groups in, within the Christian communion that do sort of traditionally have a greater appreciation built in for the Old Testament material. And also, practices to hold the testaments together that's that's something i end yeah, with yeah. in the book myself is that people think they know the new testament they really don't but right. they think they do and so one way to to have the old testament live is to just kind of continue to tie in to the new testament to way to what people think they know and then you can say ah oh, look you think you know this you, pr- you probably didn't but but anyway it's also found in the old testament and and link those together but for me, the and I kind of hit hit on this early on in my teaching when I'd kind of bemoan the state of the Old Testament. You know, mostly because I'm an Old Testament professor, and people would bemoan to me. <laughs> right, I right. would I would be moaning this in class, and then someone would say, "Well, you know, you should come to my church for my students. You should come to my church. My my pastor preaches out of the Old Testament all the time." And I thought, well, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe I should go to your church. But the question is not just if the Old Testament is present; it's how it's present. You know. How yeah, is the yeah. text taken up in this particular community? And so I, I like the idea of holding these texts together, both in this, across the Old Testament and New Testament. But it has to be done in an, an appreciative way. If the Old Testament is only used as a foil for the New Testament text, a negative example, it doesn't it doesn't say the Old Testament contributes to its decline. You know, so yeah. Or a positive example, you know, it it has all the prophecies about the coming of Jesus. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Which is which is often how it's, how it's used. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Or or the kind of also the old saw that is it's true, but it's hardly sufficient. Namely, oh, yeah, that you yeah. know you can't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. You know that that is sort of like a you know a little you know cliche people like to say that somehow sort of you know validates the Old Testament, but it doesn't actually change Christian practice. And yeah. it turns out that it's not. It's true, but it's not sufficient. Neither is the citation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right, you know? right. It just it just doesn't actually produce results in terms of of Christians who are robustly canonical can think about the language of Scripture, think in its kind of idioms and vocabulary to use your earlier term. And again, not to be weird, but because that's sort of a key piece of the language of faith. And you know, I, I think if you really engage this linguistic analogy, what it suggests is that, you know, the language of faith and the language of scripture as a subset thereof is a second language, which means our mother tongue is something else, not mm. this. And mm. that really complicates the acquisition of faith language, but it also act, uh, complicates, you know, how are we going to be bilingual? Are we going to code switch between these languages? And are we picking up the biblical languages, the, the language of faith correctly, or is it being interfered with? constantly by our first language, you know, that, that really complicates the whole shebang. But without that language of faith 
and this is something I think it's a uh, record that says this, you know, or maybe it's Steiner. I forget one of those two. You know, language is the primary means by which human beings resist the world as it is given. That's a really wonderful phrase, I think. And so without a language, you can't resist what needs to be resisted. Mm-hmm. But I would add to it, you know, you can't recognize what needs to be respected, you know, uh, God at work in the world. And you also can't re-describe what needs to be re-described, seen in a different mm-hmm. way. So, so language is a kind of grammar for us, the way which we see, negotiate, perceive reality. And without that Christian grammar, without that scriptural grammar, we're at a, we're at a fantastic loss to resist the world, the, where it needs to be resisted or or recognize in the world what needs to be recognized and respected or re-described in the world what needs to be re-described. I have uh, recently taken up the practice of banning. I have a list of Christianese words that are banned <laughs> in okay. student, from student papers. Okay. So look, you know, the, the New Testament authors, they didn't really have religious language. They had to, you know, they had to grab ideas, metaphors, and language from their culture to describe what they thought was true. And, they, yeah. you know, they had a subset of religious language. We had Mike Bird. You know Mike Bird, New Testament guy from Australia? Yeah. Uh-huh. We had him on the podcast a while back, and he had a little challenge that he poses to his students who are in seminary, which I thought was brilliant. He said, look, the apostles went and preached from the scriptures the gospel. Okay, that the scriptures are the Hebrew Bible. I want you all to go through the Hebrew Bible and start preaching the gospel. There you go. <laughs> right? nice. And just that, that constructing the gospel from the Hebrew Bible was an actual task the church had to take up, and that, and that they felt that they were— that it was sufficient for the task as well as the good well, news right. of the story they knew. Yeah. In fact, they, in fact, you know, I was talking to us to a group. So a group of lay people a couple of weeks ago and, you know, someone posed the question, you know, well, you know, if we, if we focus inordinately on the old Testament, will we somehow, somehow be not Christian or less Christian. And, you know, I was kind of like what you said with Bird. I said, you know, in the early church, you know, what they did when they're trying to figure out Jesus is figure out, go back to the Old Testament and figure things out. So what they demonstrate is that you actually become more of a Christian mm-hmm. right, <laughs> by, right. by studying all those texts very closely, not, not yeah. less. So, yeah, I agree. I agree completely. I, I was wondering if, if on your list of Christianese that we should ban is I, I would be OK with banning the word love for quite, quite some time. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until you read John Levinson's book. Ah, uh, yes. No, um, I love, love that it. book. I love that yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have uh, faith. What do I have on there? I mean, I have all the typical ones, like faith, glory, definitely took that one off, holy. Okay. But then students will also tip me off of other uh, other types of prayer language. I'm pretty convinced that nobody ever uses the word midst unless they're praying. The midst. Um, Yes, yeah, in the midst. Yeah, amongst. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whilst. <laughs> and, and and yeah, and so they think I'm being mean by banning these words, and I say, well, you don't need the word; just say what you mean, right? right. Like, like I just want you to actually know what you're talking about, not repeat cliche. Right? Um, Is it? The, yeah, no, I agree. There's these. There's the. I think a great quote from Walker Percy that talks about you know word pollution. You know mm. about words like love. You know beware. Uh, people, the word's been polluted, you know, it doesn't mean yeah. what people think it means. And uh, of course, it becomes super injected with meaning, right? And and that's never defined. And so it becomes at the end an empty cipher. I, I would I would I wouldn't mind going to church for uh, several weeks in a row and not hearing about love. But hearing about some sort of concrete <laughs> verbiage instead right. of love that would actually communicate what needs to be communicated. <laughs> yeah, which I think you know, the the Hebrew Bible is, if you just read the legal corpus of the Hebrew Bible, you're going to see concrete love and yeah, action right. there, right? Right, right. Um, or, or the other phrase, I think Matt Lynch told me this one, but if, he said, somebody had said to him once, if, if you want to know what Jesus is thinking, read read the Hebrew Bible, because that's that's what <laughs> Jesus is always thinking about. That's nice, isn't it? I was like, oh yeah, that's that's a good way to think about it. The, yeah, so actually, I've been trying to talk in my classes lately as a footnote on that is that, you know, less less about Christological readings in the you know subjective sense of that, that, that you know, the, the, that Christ is the subject of the reading is rather the or the object. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mixing up there the objective, subjective, genitive thing. Less less Christ being the object of the reading, that you're know, finding right. Jesus everywhere. But right. Rather thinking about Christ as the reading subject. Yeah, and there's all kinds of fascinating texts uh. you know, that, that showcase Jesus 
as a fast, yeah, very interesting reader in Luke four, you know, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah, but he right, right. finds in the place of the scroll where it says this, right. you know, he, he, it's not necessarily on the, uh, on the docket for the day. He, he knows where to go or in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus, you know, you know, even they have Moses and the prophets, let them believe them. You know, if they don't right. believe them, they won't even, they won't even <laughs> believe if someone is raised from the dead right. or is it Matthew 13 where he talks about, you know, for the and if you if you will believe it, he is John the he is Elijah who is to come about John the Baptist, you know. And those little three vignettes to me, I mean, show Jesus is a, you know is a very you know immediate reader. The words of Scripture apply now in in this right. day. The, right. These words have been fulfilled in your hearing, and they they find uh, Jesus as a as a sensitive reader of the of the entirety of Scripture, and they show Jesus as kind of a, a transformational reader, you know, existential reader. If you will believe it, he is. Yeah. Elijah, who is to come? He's not really Elijah, but if but he is, if you're willing to accept. Right, him. and I think even so, so, something even like that, man. For an Old Testament scholar, you really know your New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it once. I read it once through in high school. <laughs> the hero makes a great comeback. <laughs> right. <laughs> But even thinking of something like how the New Testament authors, especially the Synoptic Gospels, how they're using Scripture without citing citing it, right? So in Luke, uh, so Luke also did, basically announces that John the Baptist is is the Elijah mm-hmm. by gathering up the language of Malachi, who says, yeah, you know, the yeah. Malachi, the the one who yeah. comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and yeah. you know the the root or the axolate at the root language, all the oven burning language. Yeah. So he's grabbing all this conceptuality and language and he's just burying it right there in the the promise of the angel to Zechariah right assuming that you're picking up what he's laying down right, right, right. so he thinks you're a pretty he th- thinks you're saturated enough in the prophets in the torah to right. to pick up like oh okay it's John the Baptist who is yeah, is the yeah. one to come i had my, um, my former colleague Luke Johnson talked about this talked about this in terms of you know the old testament is a symbolic world within mm-hmm. which the, all the new testament authors live so of right. course, that's what they did, you know, and right. if, you, if you're not attuned to that world, you miss, you know, all of it, all those and the, illusions and everything else you're talking about. The one way I found to, to illustrate this to my students that like it snaps in for them is I play these mashup songs on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where yeah, they yeah. grab like 10 different top 40 songs and they yeah. blend them together. That's awesome. And, I, and I'm like. That's what I hear when I read scripture. Like yeah, yeah. I, I hear all these allusions and hooks from various places and draw. Yeah, that's and, a great yeah. example. That's a great example. Um, I, I used to think when I started teaching that, you know, I could just sort of hunker down and do my Old Testament thing and that my New Testament colleagues would come along after me and help, <laughs> help the students see the connections. Sorry. I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> well, right. well, right. I mean, it slowly <laughs> dawned on me. They aren't doing that either. And it's not necessarily because they don't want to, but they have their other things to cover. And Right. I realized, realized, look, if I'm going to, if, if this is going to kind of thinking integratively about the Testaments, if it's going to happen, that's happened in my class. I yeah. can't let someone else come along and do it because it's not being done. So, you know, I, I do talk about uh, the New Testament and uh, the person of Christ, et cetera, you know, Trinitarian doctrine and things like this far more than I used to when I first came out of grad school, because I realized if, if it's not happening from the get go out of the gate with the Old Testament class, it's just not going to happen. And uh, so I, I'm hoping to still give the Old Testament its due, you know, but also realizing that, you know, within within the discourse of Christian theology, you know, we, we have to work hard on, on integrating and uniting these things, which are just fraying and have been frayed for for you know millennia. I, I had the exact same experience. The first few years, I wouldn't even mention the name Jesus in my class. <laughs> And when students would say Jesus, I'd say like, I'd say like, who who is this Jesus you're talking yeah. about? You know, yeah, and and right. now I spend I did the exact same thing. I spend a lot of time making the connections for them. And like when you get your New Testament class, you'll remember this. You know, well, um, I feel kind of sad when I encounter students who are like you, you know, who graduated, and you can tell, you know, where they went or who they studied with or whatever. Not not necessarily by name, but they they're just doing, you know, these contorted things to avoid calling at the Old Testament or avoid right. speaking of Jesus as, as all of these things are completely, you know, unconscionable sins, you know, which they aren't uh, as Christians, but they, yeah, that doesn't mean they're, they're done cavalierly, right? There's, there's right. really crappy Christological reading and there's really amazingly Absolutely. good Christological reading. So, um, Before we let you go, I wonder if we could get you to talk a little bit about another area of expertise for you. This is just a side hustle for you, this whole Old Testament is dying <laughs> thing. 
But what you're expert in is the kind of the visual and conceptual world of the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible as well. And so I wonder if there are a few, like if you could pull, if, if you had the ear of the entire global church for an hour, and you could say like, look, here's just some things you need to get your head around that will help you out. That'll, what are some conceptual hurdles that, you know, if you could get them back into the minds of the biblical authors, of the biblical world, wh- wh- where would you take them first and foremost? Oh, wow. That's a fascinating question. I don't, I don't know if I, I'd have to put some serious thought into it if I was going to address the global church for an hour. <laughs> Well, yeah, I should say global. How about the American church? That's actually, that was unfair to say global church. Well, I mean, so I do have these sorts of different sides of my my academic soul and theological soul that, that I try not to bifurcate, but there, there's definitely pieces that emphasize or lean different ways, though I think in some ways, a lot of times they're united. I mean, I think my interest in the theological claim of, of the biblical text, you know, is at root related to those sorts of conceptual things, you know, who is, who is this God and who, what is the non-God world and what's the relationship between the God and the non-God world. Mm. And for me, can I stop you right there? Yeah, Have you, okay. So everybody was just like, what is he talking about the God and the (laughs) non-God world? So what do you mean by that? So, I mean, the, 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 the God, the the God in God's own self, that would be the God, the God world, the divine world. And then the non-God world in my, would be everything that's not God. You know, it'd be the predominantly, you know, as we think about it, a kind of, okay. the, the natural world, the, the human denizens of, of the planet and the sort of thing, creatures, animals, plants, et cetera. And then what's the complex relationship between this divine entity and everything that is not the divine entity? I think th- those three centers are what theology is about. It's not just discourse about God. It's also discourse about the non-God world, that the, the non-theological is actually profoundly theological in the ancient world. And mm. in some sense, there is no division. You know, that everything is sort of religious all the way down. Uh, it's not right. really appropriate to speak of religion and non-religion. It's sort of, in some ways, it's all religion. And and then this complex relationship between the two. And in recent years, that's made me want to think more and more sensitively and empathetically about ancient Near Eastern religions. So, you know, it's it's been common in, in our discipline, you know, especially in certain stages in the discipline vis-a-vis ancient Near Eastern sources to be very denigrating of them, you know, look down on them. These are primitive religion. You know, this is pagan religion or whatever. Of course, other scholars have come along and said, well, it turns out this thing that looks so pagan. Yeah. Well, the Israelites probably did it too. Or mm-hmm. this thing that looks all unique in ancient Israelite religion. Well, if you, if you know anything about the ancient world, it turns out it's not unique. So you got to think hard about commonality as well as uniqueness among in Israelite religion and and also in Moabite religion and Egyptian religion. Whatever. Every every religion in its aggregate form is unique, and it but it and it bears but it bears at the at these large you know lower levels all kinds of commonalities with its ancient Near Eastern congeners. And you know I I think that you know people really did worship you know. Gods like Baal or, you know, Ray or Marduk or something with insincerity and truth. And mm-hmm. I think that there's something that needs to be that needs to be sort of acknowledged and sort of sympathetically and empathetically understood in order to try to capture something of the ancient mindset towards the divine realm. And so that's one thing I think I would say. And and in my mind, what this has helped me think about is how even the most in modern terms, disturbing aspects of God's personality in scripture are really just nothing more or less than proof of God's godness, God's raw divinity. Hmm. The more frightening, the more powerful, the more overwhelming the God was, the more outlandish a God was. This is just proof of the God's godness. Hmm. And that's that would be a major difference from a modern reader to an ancient reader. We, we kind of come across something that God does in the Bible that makes us squirm a little bit. And we think, oh, well, I'm just, I'm sort of offended. You know, I'm slightly, I feel slightly uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, whereas I think in the ancient world, it'd be like, yeah, that's what gods do. They are just- that, <laughs> Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now I know that I'm dealing with a God rather right, than right. just somebody else. And so that's, 
that doesn't fix it all, right? That doesn't fix some of the reasonable concerns we would have, but it is trying to inhabit, as it were, a kind of ancient Near Eastern mindset or, or you know, worldview, thought view, Hebraic thought, dare one say. I think the other two things I'd mentioned briefly is, is my interest in, yeah, you, you raised it in art, iconography, ancient Near Eastern, visual remains. I think that's a remarkable entry point into the way people thought and the way people made meaning. More people could read a picture in the ancient world than they could read a text. And so the visual remains are very important. And somehow that that interest in kind of you know art as opposed to text, it's never fully opposed to text, but but my interest in art in some ways at the you know trying to privilege that art in some ways over over text is related in an, in a weird way to my great interest in poetry, which is really high uh, text form, hmm. but at the same time heavily imagistic. So, you know, like as, as in painting, so also in poetry, you know, yeah. <laughs> in pictura poesis. So I think these, which I've sometimes thought about as different in my interest, poetry on the one hand and art on the other hand, really are, are deeply connected at the level of, of the image, figurative mm-hmm. language. And, and I think a, a poetic mindset, one that's really attuned to the visual, the, art, the artistic, the image, that's going to go a whole lot further in understanding the Bible than what the ways we tend to think now, which are heavily data driven, logic driven, also social media driven in, in more recent days and, and, and narrative line, linearly driven. I, I just don't think that's primarily the best way to think about the Bible and its ancient world. Well, Dr. Brent Strawn, thank you very much for your wisdom. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I don't know if it's wisdom, but it's great to be with you, Drew, and learn from your wisdom. So thanks for having me on. Ah, shucks. You've been listening to the Biblical Mind Podcast, exploring the deep structures of Christian scripture. For more, visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org. Subscribe to this podcast at all the usual places so you never miss an episode. 